All right, good afternoon and good evening. And welcome to Baltimore Rotterdam Designing Cities Conversation Series. I am Christina Murphy, Assistant Professor at Morgan School of Architecture and Planning. And in this hour, I hope that my guest and I will be successful in answering questions related to cities, people, spaces, equity, and design. In response to last spring's webinar on designing cities, addressing spatial and social inequities and injustices, we launched this sequel. The series intends to critically look at theories gained through the 2022 event and provide practical inputs to current urban challenges. The center of this critique is the city and the community. For four Tuesdays from today until March the 7th, 18 architects from Baltimore, the US, and Rotterdam, the Netherlands, led by four international moderators, will, together with you, ask and answer, how do architects design spaces for people? This question has been intentionally left as general as possible and open for obvious reasons. Each of the four roundtables will dynamically explore designs that value infrastructure, cities, public spaces, communities, and individuals. Before I move on further, I would like to inform you that, uh, inform the audience that this, these web webinars are all recorded. Please put yourself on mute and turn off your videos unless you are a panelist. Attendees, if you do not want to be recorded, you should keep your video off, of course, and stay on mute during the entire event. You're welcome to ask questions using the chat or the Q&A box. For those interested in getting the AIA credit, we do need to collect your names and AIA number. We have a Google link in the chat box, the form, you need to fill in the form. We do take questions. You can either raise your hand and ask or type your question. Kindly do so when the moderator opens questions and answers. Today moderators is Thais van, van Spandonk leading the session that is, which team is urban ecology, accomplish environmental and social justice through sustainable ap uh, approaches. Thais is partner at Bright, an R&D cooperative for urban development. He co-founded with Kirian Streng in 2017. Bright, produ Bright produces observations and prototypes to investigate and intervene in the impact of systems of energy food, mobility, and economy on our surroundings. Project outcomes range from serious gains to large public exhibitions, from housing for bats to public buildings, and from speculative scenarios to policy advice for the national government. Thais was co-curator co co for the International Architecture Biennale in Rotterdam, the IABR in 2020 and in 2021. Thais is currently the head of the urban design department at the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture and Urban Design. And a colleague of mine, Thais and I uh, organize trips to Baltimore and Rotterdam and craft studio courses during the spring sem semesters. Thais, welcome and thank you for accepting this invitation. I will give the session to you and to our guests. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Christina, for the invitation to uh, um, be able to moderate this this evening. Um, yeah, you did a full um, uh, full introduction. Um, uh, the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture, is, it's, uh, we have, a, I think, now like a five-year collaboration with Morgan State University uh, School of Architecture and Planning. And um, uh, before COVID, um, we also did a physical exchange, which is, uh, uh, I'm very happy that this year we will be able to um, do that physical exchange again. People from Baltimore visiting Rotterdam and uh, vice versa, hopefully. Um, yes, we have a very tight schedule uh, this lunch or afternoon. It's uh, dinner time in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Um, we're having four speakers um, in, uh, well, actually, we're having six speakers because two uh, two of the speakers are um, presenting themselves their, themselves as a team. I will just briefly introduce them um, after I tell you something about the, the theme um, uh, of this uh, of this um, this 
well, this lunch uh, evening lecture. Um, um, today, we're going to talk about um, designing public space, both uh, for the environment, but also uh, for social justice. So we're really looking into project, we're going to look into projects by uh, the participants of this panel um, and how they approach this, uh, this certain topic. So both from the environmental perspective and also from the social justice per perspective, but more interesting, and I think that's in all of the projects um, that these two very often overlap and one supports the other. Um, and hopefully that's also what the, the, the conversation afterwards uh, will be about. Um, I will uh, in a second just briefly introduce the, the speakers. We all have about like six minutes, more like a Pecha Kucha style uh, um, uh, pace of presentations. Um, if you have any questions uh, throughout the, the 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 presentations, please feel free to uh, add them in the chat, um, so we can uh, already uh, you know start moderating the questions and see you, uh, who would uh, fit best to, to answer, but also to kind of group the questions maybe. Um, because the session will be recorded, I think also the questions I will not read out who asked the question, so uh, that it will stay kind of. Um, uh, uh, anonymous. Um, yeah, we should be finished more or less in, in about an hour. Uh, we're missing one of the speakers, I think, still, uh, but hopefully he will join yes. us a, a bit later. Um, in, in the order of, of the announcement, uh, we're going to listen to um, first uh, Paul Riley and and Kevin Vazachi, uh, they're both um, uh, uh, connected to the firm MCA. Uh, Paul is a vice president and uh, Kara as an associate principal. Um, and they will tell us something about uh, um, I think public buildings, um, which are of course also part of a public space. Then after we're going to listen to uh, Mel Schultz and uh, Jacqueline Bershat. Uh, they are working on a project, um, a public space design, uh, a floating public space design um, that is uh, uh, next to the, the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Um, Amel is the principal of uh, uh, A.R. St. Gross, um, the design firm, and Jacqueline Bershad is the vice president of planning and design for the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Um, very much also looking forward to that presentation. Then we're supposed to have, uh, or we're planning to have Jan Jongert, um, who is uh, one of the founding partners of SuperU Studios, uh, a circular design and development firm, um, started off in Rotterdam, but now having uh, offices in Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, but also in DC, in the US, and in uh, Beijing, China, um, working on all the different aspects from research, mapping, uh, sourcing materials, but also to building prototypes with circular materials. Um, and, and really uh, developing the ecosystems. And then we're going to finish off, uh, last but not least, with uh, David Avis. He's a lecturer and um, uh, uh, urban geographer, a part of um, uh, the, um, the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences. I, I want to say Hogeschool Rotterdam, but that's a very Dutch name and nobody understands anyway. So, um, and he... Um, uh, and it's a surprise what it's going to tell, but I'm quite sure it's going to be interesting. I know so, a lot of his previous work. Um, and then we have some time for um, for a panel discussion, for um, some questions from from you, the, the participants in the in this uh, lecture series. Um, so I just want to get started now with with Paul and Kara. Um, you can share your screen. We tested this all, so it should be able to uh, it should it should work. Um, yeah. Can everyone see? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, the floor is yours, Kara. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, you there? Yes, I'm here. You want to kick? You want to kick us off? Sure. So thank you, Christina, and thank you, Tis, for you know putting this together and hosting this event. Um, thank you to all the other um, people that are going to be presenting today. We're really excited to be a part of this. Um, MCA has been um, really excited about this webinar series and we're excited to contribute to the discussion about designing cities and designing for people. This topic is very important to the culture of MCA and what MCA stands for. Go next. 
Kara? Yep. So what? I'm so glad. What? <laughs> Nothing. Um, oh, okay. So, <laughs> well, so MC. I'm Paul what? Riley with the um, pres Vice President of MCA, and I'm a generalist architect. Um, design is my passion to find a unique story, and every opportunity is what drives me. I joined MCA in 2019, and Kara, you've been with MCA for? Originally since 2009. 2009. <laughs> so Kara's an associate principal here at the firm, and she leads our cultural sector. And that's what we're going to be talking to you about in a minute. Um, MCA was founded in 1986, and we've been driven by one radical mission, which is do the right thing. Do the right thing means something different for each individual, and how each person embraces that, that mission is what makes MCA's approach so unique. MCA is committed to fostering, cultivating, and preserving a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion in both our team and our clients. At MCA, it's all about people and community. We're always looking for great people and communities to collaborate with who share this core value. This is exemplified in the long history with many of our clients and the wide range of sectors we work in. Next screen. Our clients share a common thread that are driven by a mission that's focused on the community and serving the people. In the last year's webinar, MCA focused our presentation on healthcare planning and design and the introduction of crisis centers into neighborhoods to address the urgent need for help in our communities. This year, we would like to talk about a very different project type, and we would like to share a very important project that we will be completed later this year. This project is in our cultural sector, and Kara, our cultural sector lead, will be sharing the history, the story, and the details of this project and how it is impacting the urban ecology and addressing the environmental and social justice through design and the mission of the project. MCA works in a wide variety of culture or sector types, which include cultural, federal government, healthcare, private enterprise, higher education, historic and adaptive reuse, pre-K and 12, and science and education. Um, all of these sectors have a common thread, and that really comes back to people and um, how our mission is to do the right thing. And the next project we're, we're going to be talking about are the cultural projects, and this is where Kara takes over. Thanks, Paul. Um, MCA, as Paul mentioned, has many different sectors, but the cultural sector has um, a very vast experience with museums in particular. And this was a great project type um, to talk about for today's lecture, given our theme. Um, our experience with um, museums goes from anywhere from a, a project for one museum to um, several long-term contracts with uh, very high profile institutions such as Harvard University's Dumbarton Oaks and um, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, we've done work for the Smithsonian and others, but today we're going to focus on one particular project that's ongoing right now. It's under construction, um, one that we're very excited about, which is the National Museum of Women in the Arts. And um, this fits our theme perfectly because NMWA's mission um, is solely around championing women in the arts. They are the first institution in the world that um, has this mission and is completely focused on promoting women artists. Um, we're the architect of record for this project and we're working with lead and design architect Sandra Vicchione Associates. Uh, this has been a challenging site. It's right in the middle of DC, not too far from the White House. And I highly recommend anybody to go and visit this once it opens in the fall. Um, very great institution, wonderful art, wonderful programs. Um, and this building is on the National Registry of, of Historic Places. The exterior is uh, was originally built in 1908. And uh, there's a very interesting story about that, which I'll get to on the next slide. But also part of the renovation, um, we are going for LEED certification. Um, so we, this project, in addition to being um, one for social justice, is also uh, environmentally sustainable. So as I mentioned, um, this building uh, has an interesting history. It was built in 1908 as a Masonic temple. Um, so women were not actually allowed to enter all parts of the building when it was originally built. Um, and uh, it was purchased in 1985 for the National Museum of Women in the Arts, and they have been housed there ever since. And this is their first renovation since 1985, so it's very exciting. Um, in addition to um, 
the mission being promoting women, our design team and our construction teams also are full of very talented women and men as well. But this photo you can see taken right here was um, uh, taken last March during Women's History Month. You can see a number of, of our team there with um, uh, Susan Fisher Sterling, who is the uh, director of the museum. Um, so one of the challenging things about this building is the original construction, which is a steel frame, which is co covered with terracotta. Um, that kind of um, covered up a lot of the steel. So we were having trouble really kind of identifying a lot of the existing um, structure as, during design. So a lot of surprises and a lot of hidden conditions became uh, made themselves clear during um, construction. So we had to utilize a lot of um, BIM coordination, not only during design, but also in um, construction to really work our, work our way through different problems as they uh, came up. But um, we are able to do that still um, very seamlessly to maximize the amount of open gallery spaces to really support the museum's mission. Um, in addition to that, um, we also still are able to maintain a very sustainable design, uh, which has always been on the forefront of our, of our project. Um, one feature that I want to talk about in particular was the envelope. So the envelope design is um, very important, not only for preserving the historic exterior, but also to preserving the collections that reside within it. Um, we designed a bubble within a bubble, an envelope within an envelope, so to speak, um, which you can see here on the screen in blue. Um, the blue areas are the galleries and the collection spaces, which are um, have their own interior conditions that help support the preservation of the collections. And then the areas surrounding it are uh, have temperatures that are more uh, comfortable for human environments. So we basically separated those internally to um, create both comfortable zones for the collections themselves and the people around them. And we had to do that all kind of invisibly without impacting the galleries themselves so that the people who are visiting and exploring the art are able to focus on the art as opposed to the systems. And as Paul mentioned, um, our, our mission with the museum, the museum's mission is also something that's very important to us in really promoting um, the diversity of our, of our team and of our firm. And Paul, I'll let you kind of make closing remarks. Yeah, so thank you, Kara. Um, yeah, our people are really what makes us a unique group and what, you know, who we go after for our clients and our mission is, you know, all intertwined. We try to work with the same type of people that we are and, you know, we try to give back to the community in every way we can. So thank so, you. Yep. Yeah. Um, don't know if anybody has any questions now or if we want to save them for the, the panel discussion at the end. I don't see any question in the chat yet, but uh, uh, but, uh, but thank you for sharing. Um, just one question that's very practical. You were saying it's opening this fall. That means end of the year, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep. It's not open yet in April. No, they closed. Um, they closed for for the renovation for two years. So ah, okay. um, yeah, they're 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 doing some grand reopening starting this fall. So it's very exciting, and they're really yeah. excited. Um, but please go visit their website. Um, and at nmwa.org um, to learn more about their current programs and their mission and um, all the stuff that, that you can currently see. How long have you been working on this project, Kara? Ooh, um, originally since um, 2017, I believe. So it's been a long time in coming. It's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll get to talk about it uh, a bit later uh, later on. Um, I want to give the floor. Thank you so much again, uh, Karen and Paul. Um, I want to give the the screen now to um, uh, Amel and uh, and Jacqueline. And can you confirm? Are you seeing my screen in presentation mode, or are you mm -hmm. seeing? Okay, thank you. 
not presentation yeah, one. We can not, see the, the ones on the left. Sorry. Okay, just let me give this one more try. <laughs> Thank you, Karen, Paul, while we're getting that set up. That looks like a great project. I'm looking forward to going to see it in the fall when it opens. Um, well, thank you. I'm Jacqueline again, and Amel um, from the National Aquarium, and Amel is from Air St. Gross um, Architects here in Baltimore. And we appreciate your um, having us for this, this discussion because it really is in line with the kind of work uh, that we have been doing on our urban floating wetlands project. So how can urban ecology help us rebuild our community? We're framing this presentation and really this project has been framed as an investigation of this question. It starts with a problem people are trying to solve. I'm starting here because while there are a lot of big ideas and a lot of pretty pictures later in our presentation, um, the reality is that this project started with a couple of curious and dedicated individuals trying to solve a problem. So the problem you're seeing right there on your screen is Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Um, it is a damaged ecosystem. Some problems like trash you can see and some you can't see like bad water quality. We have unbalanced nutrients, insufficient oxygen that don't support healthy habitats. And this is our core team working on our current project that was in our current prototype, excuse me, that was installed back in 2018. This is National Aquarium staff who are passionate, really passionate about addressing urban ecology and restoring a healthy ecosystem. And that ecosystem is for water, it's for plants, it's for animals, and it is for people too. So to go back to that issue of how long, um, you can see that the first prototype for this project was started back in 2010. Um, there have been three, and then the fourth one that you saw on the first slide. Um, and you know, if you're going to be able, if you want to do innovative work, you have to be willing to test it and fail and test it and fail. And that's really what um, this kind of process is about. So then we created a vision and people get excited. Um, and that prototyping, that investigation is very important, but the reality is you're not going to get people, most people excited on a big scale by that kind of work. So you have to create a vision. And this was the first vision of the project, which um, was very comprehensive, but maybe not engaging to a large audience. Uh, we then worked with Studio Gang Architects out of Chicago, and they partnered with the team to transform what you saw into an iconic vision of a Chesapeake wetland in the Inner Harbor that will serve as the heart of our campus. So then it becomes a real project. We go from prototyping and lots of big, pretty ideas, um, and we develop goals. And one of the things I've really uh, learned working here at the National Aquarium, my team includes ex exhibition design, and that team is really great about um, creating clear and compelling goals for our project. So our primary goal is to promote urban conservation, um, and that is not just, again, ecosystem services, although that's an important part of it, but it is connecting people to that um, work that we do. And uh, another goal is to create a civic social space. And Amel and I have used this slide, I'll be honest, many times before. And I realized <laughs> in, putting, you know, in putting this presentation together that this is in the Netherlands. Um, which is, uh, you know, I think very representative of a Dutch approach to work, which is very community focused um, and about connecting people and connecting people to places. So um, I kind of laughed when I saw the, the name at the bottom there. Um, but the goal is to create a civic social space to be welcoming, engaging, relevant to all audiences, and importantly, to facilitate social interactions. That's a big goal of what we do throughout the National Aquarium and um, you know, an important role in any kind of urban design. And for us too, it's also very important to be a civic anchor. Uh, the National Aquarium you know, was part of the revitalization of the Inner Harbor in the 80s and we continue to uh, view our role there as critical. 
and hand it over to Amel. Yeah. And so, you know, Jacqueline and, and her team have really been working on the idea of wetlands and the evolution of what that means for the National Aquarium over more than a decade. And we were fortunate enough to be brought in to work with them to make those, those visions and those lessons learned a reality. And so part of that is really learning from the experts that are in it every day. And these you know, what I think are quite lovely sections are actually the work of one of those two uh, people that you saw in an earlier photo um, uh, on the uh, working on the prototype itself. This is the general curator, Jack Cover, was trying to explain to us how he envisioned this would uh, work and uh, promote habitat. So, you know, this is a very engaged process that is not just us as designers, but us working with a team of designers and experts in the field to make this vision a reality. Essentially, the big takeaways of the difference between the, the first prototypes where the lessons were learned and the one that we are moving forward with is the idea of allowing this uh, floating wetland to have longevity. Longevity so that over time, the biomass growth doesn't grow um, to, to be to such an extent to have the floating wetland actually sink to the bottom of the harbor. And that is really, as well as uh, looking at um, additional opportunities to enhance um, water quality in order to allow life of the, um, uh, you know, wildlife, the fishes and um, adjacent. And this is accomplished really through a system of pontoon um, structures that allow us to actually put air into the system to raise the wetland over time as it accumulates biomass with growth and becomes heavier so that it doesn't sink. The addition of um, air filters that uh, hang down into the water itself and allow to have adjacent kind of cleaning of the water immediately um, uh, proximate to the wetland itself, as well as the addition of air filters um, that actually have up at the water's edge that create that flow through the stream, the um, ch open channel that meanders its way through the system. And when we started on this project, it, you know, we, we, Jacqueline and I are talking really focused on the prototype, but it really is part of a larger comprehensive vision for the whole campus that looks at how we connect people to the water. Um, and in particular, how the National Aquarium campus is an opportunity to link the people from this community and visitors to the greater Chesapeake Bay watershed in which um, the aquarium uh, resides. So right now we're talking about um, the, the effort that's there in the water, the floating wetlands, which is representative of the salt marsh. Uh, here's a view of what that slip uh, looks like in Baltimore today. It's, you know, open water. There is, uh, you know, few and far between animals that can be that can be found and living in this condition with those challenged water conditions Jacqueline showed in the first slide. And really the vision is to bring the, to reality the idea of um, that salt marsh in a floating condition on a floating wetland, and also to allow, um, incorporate a learning dock experience to educate and teach visitors to the aquarium um, uh, about this ecosystem and uh, the value uh, that this uh, project is bringing to the habitat immediately adjacent. But a big part of getting to that uh, large vision is testing the outcomes through the prototype. And so back in 2017, the, a prototype was installed at a very small scale. And since then, we've been learning how the original design um, is able to, you know, create the bio uh, the biodiversity and ecological health, as well as uh, looking at water quality over time. And there has been, um, they have worked with, the aquarium itself has worked with a number of institutional partners. They, there are water quality systems located throughout the area to test the water quality. And there is um, an extensive amount of information gathered from that over the past, you know, five years of work. And in addition to that, related to habitat, the 
idea was moving it from the then to the now in this diagram that it is, um, you know, very little life that is able to be supported in these waters to a, a diverse um, uh, system of, uh, uh, of life that is able to be supported both above and beneath the water. And the aquarium has done a lot of research in quantifying what animals are able to live both in and above the water. And this particular image is just one example of um, kind of on the left-hand side of your screen, the before, uh, um, the before sort of condition. And on the right-hand side of your screen, underwater, the um, after condition. And this is these are just all of the um, species that were able to survive with that added aeration um, under the water on the pile itself. And so now we're at a really exciting point where the past five years of research are uh, allowing us to um, move this project forward and make the larger project a reality. So um, although we aren't able to share with you yet what that reality is, because it very much is in the works and on the boards, um, it is moving forward with the wetland and the learning dock. And um, all with this um, intent of, of bringing this, uh, you know, habitat refuge to the slip here as part of it to reinforce the National Aquarium's mission and also as a public, um, uh, you know, really opportunity for the, the, the people who visit. So that sums up our presentation. I don't know if you want us to take questions now or, or turn it over to the next panelist. Um, there's no questions from the audience yet, but I have um, a small question. I'm not sure if it's small, maybe it's big, but um, no, no, I was very interested by the idea of actually prototyping uh, these things and just testing stuff and uh, uh, and then see what happens. Did any kind of unexpected results came out of those prototyping? So the good news is that we have learned that the prototype has been successful in accommodating over the past five years some of the things that uh, we were trying that we were trying to accomplish: increased biodiversity, um, as well as the ability to withstand the added biomass that would prevent sinking. And there have been um, there has been more biomass accumulation than we had anticipated. So the pontoon structures in this new version are looking to actually accommodate um, this increased growth, which on one hand is a great you know, result that things are growing there and thriving. Um, in addition to that, Jacqueline, there have been minor tweaks to sort of the mechanics of it all that are more detailed solutions um, that we're integrating moving forward. But I don't know, Jacqueline, if you had others. No, I mean, a couple of the more high level ones are, are really honestly how effective it was very, very quickly in bringing that species diversity, both the things that, you know, we showed you pictures of under the water and, um, you know, night herons and turtles and pumpkin fish and blue crabs. Um, you know, almost overnight um, started to inhabit that small prototype. So I think that was, you know, honestly, even better than we expected. Um, I would say, and and I would say the other is um, how beneficial that aeration that um, Amel described. So, you know, there's the aeration that make the pontoons work, but then we're also, um, pushing um, aeration kind of similar to what we do in an aquarium, quite frankly, um, into the water to oxygenate it. And that is really what um, supports the water quality even more so than um, the planting, just it's sort of a, a quantity issue. So those are a couple of the good takeaways. Yeah, and just to uh, add on to that, if for those of you from Baltimore, we all know our connection to the blue crab. And one of the signs of success that this project has had is that there have actually been uh, blue crabs that have um, actually molted on the on the prototype itself, among many other species, but there is a special uh, connection to the blue crab in Baltimore. Um, okay, thank you so much, uh, Emel and uh, Jacqueline. I think we will get back to the to the to the project uh, after our last speaker, because we're actually missing one of the speakers. Um, but that means we have more time for you. So I think that's a, a, 
it's not per se a bad thing. Uh, David, please feel free to take the screen. Um, Yes, I will. Thanks. Um, all right. Um, just have to check if I can. Yeah. All right. You're seeing my screen, right? Yeah, I think it's working. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, good afternoon. <laughs> good evening for some of you and the rest of it uh, earlier um, on this day. Thanks for having me. Uh, uh, I'm a urban geographer. I'm not no designer or something, so I can't really <laughs> tell something about I, uh, things I've designed. Um, I'm gonna tell talk a bit more about the way we, as a, a Hogeschool, as a University of Applied Science, um, try to to well to um, deal or to um, incorporate uh, ecology uh, within our urban um, degrees. And our, some of the degrees are the spatial planning degrees, urbanism, uh, water management, and among uh, others. And I will tell something about it. And um, I was really triggered about the, 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 the title, the theme of this, of this webinar, uh, Urban Ecology. Um, I think, well, it's nice, but maybe we can change that. that uh, uh, yeah, we can change it a bit. Because maybe we have to really to 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 rethink ecology and also like the urban um, uh, itself. Um, I think it's kind of a, uh, it won't be great if we just try as designers or uh, urban developers, um, urban professionals to just adapt or add some ecology into our work. Uh, just put some solar panels on on houses and roofs and just to do some sustainable stuff uh, within our work but to really change the way we do things because it's it's urgent you know i mean the like the climate change it's the 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 planet is heating up the biodiversity is declining so I really like the 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 the, the previous uh, presentation um and the uh, before and after uh, shots so we really have to change like that urban ecology what's i think it's a good team again uh, into well, the other way around, ecology maybe first, and then just the urban or eco-urban. I was just trying how to, what's a good word for it? Urban, eco-urbanity, eco-urbanism, eco-urbanization. I'm not sure, but what's in the name? Uh, the thing is, I think we have to really change our look of, um, of ecology and also of the urban practices and to really switch, uh, uh, shift from a more egocentric perspective to a more ecocentric perspective. Does not just always talk about it like the users, end users and the, the residents, citizens, but really as just one big uh, system uh, we're dealing with and we have to, uh, we are just a part of. Uh, um, and that's something what we are, well, what's like getting and growing uh, within our uh, university. And I think it's very important to 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 to, to make that shift, in, um, you know, uh, with with all the like the the the, the available knowledge knowledge sources, um, like the theoretical knowledge, the practical knowledge, and experiential knowledge. And I will give some examples of that later on. First, the theoretical knowledge, it's just like more the, the what the scholars think and what what's what the book said. I think there's a new, there's a whole library written the last maybe five, 10, 15 years about the, the urgence of ecology and also the, the way we have to rethink uh, what the, the, the uh, what we are doing and how we are living, how we work, how we're building. So really looking and searching for new foundations. And um, well, you have thousands of, of ideas and models about new approaches to economy like the donut economy or new approach uh, or different approach on growth degrowth uh, post growth uh, how you want to call it new basis new just like rethink and that's also i what i see in in my class room what students is uh, what's on the mind of the students they're really rethinking our base our foundations uh, maybe we have to change stuff radically uh, and one interesting part uh, also concerning ecology is i think in the netherlands um we talk well for for some decades in planning we're talking about layers and about the the the, the soil and um just recently in november the government's um 
decided to to make water and soil um like the guiding principle so really ecology is uh, is yeah determines um our our uh, our our urban development and our planning and i think that's a very interesting one uh, especially in the netherlands because like the the western part of the country with the big cities is below zero so it's not just a good idea to to build more houses there although uh, well whatever so that, that's i think some there are some things changing and another one what's very interesting and a lot of our uh, lots of our students are working uh, with it and have great ideas it's more like the practical uh, practical knowledge so not just the knowledge from the books but really to see in in practice uh, in 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 daily in uh, on daily basis in the streets with professionals with the government with citizens to find out what is working one of our students is uh, Anis, and he did a nice research in one of the in two neighborhoods in Rotterdam, and he was concerning about um, uh, the urban heat island or the yeah urban uh, heat island effect, and you just went to the streets with a lot of people and talked to a lot of people and really tried to understand uh, what really are the like the consequences of the urban heat uh, island effect and what they are try what what they uh, what. What their wishes or hopes or uh, or um, yeah future plans would be for their streets to don't make it that hot in summer. And one of the results was a, was a score map of of the of of the of like of the heat of the warmth of of the streets into uh, neighborhoods of Rotterdam, and it's now used used by the local government. Um, and another one we are trying to do, and that's more about the experience knowledge, or so really the knowledge from the people who are experiencing, who have like the, the we are living it. Uh, it's about capabilities, for example. It's something we are doing more and more with our students. That's not just talk and <laughs> give them lectures about ecology and uh, and and urbanism or green uh, greening the city or a sustainable uh, ur uh, urban development. But just to well to take them uh, into the city and to go well collect garbage for example, or go with them uh, and uh, hook up with some uh, local residents and replacing uh, tiles stones for uh, plants for example uh, what you are seeing here on the photos it's a nice thing to do and also I think a important thing to do just not to 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 learn about uh, the the importance of of of, of green and sustainability but just also experience it and even more some of our students are um well also experiencing themselves but also transferring all the knowledge and all the new uh, ideas uh, to to the next generation so here you see on the photo some students of mine um they were doing a research about the, the water pollution um in the canals in some um in the canals in some of some neighborhoods and they did some testing and some some experiments with uh, with the primary school kids, and made them also aware of the what the pollution um, uh, they're well not seeing but facing and uh, in the future too. So those are I think some 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 ex uh, short, very brief examples of how we try to learn with the city as a university applying science and not just from the city i mean we can just go to city to, to residents and tell them what they have to do or how it's how it works or just made them a great building or um but we really try to 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 to, to do it like in a, in a mutual understanding uh, way uh, by working on well eco urbanity or urbanism or urbanization or, or what name you you will give it, and to really try uh, to connect and to merge all those different types of knowledges um, together: the theoretical knowledge, the practical knowledge, and the experiential knowledge. And I think we have to do it. Uh, I think that's important for us. It's like an assignment for our uh, University of Applied Science because we are a big university. We have more than 40,000 students, and loads of, of scholars and, and, and lecturers and, and researchers um, too and we are we are scattered through all through the, uh, the city in different uh, buildings and locations and so I think it's also like a test or like an, an assignment for us as a, a University of Applied Science to really con uh, contribute um, to the to the city and to its residents because we are a significant part of the urban um, community and that's the, the the giving and the 
the the being uh, uh, the, the being valuable for the city uh, we do uh, by um, four guiding principles and the first one is to be very will be available be present in um, in the neighborhoods to not just well get information or data to also give a lot of information it's reciprocity to be equal everyone is expert also the residents well especially the residents i think and also to be uh, to be to, to stay there for a long time because well the problems uh, the, the university won't disappear in 10 15 years and the challenges especially the ecological challenges we're facing uh, either unfortunately thank you um thank you david uh, thank you so much for your for your presentation and um i think it's very interesting what a community of uh, 40 plus thousand people can actually uh, contribute to the city um i mean it's all it's not one tenth but uh, but almost i mean uh could be could be close um hey jan you're also there um i just want to because the the last speaker he dropped in the meeting, so um, uh, and I also want to give him some time to uh, to tell a story. Uh, Jan Jongert, I already introduced you. Uh, you're the founding partner of uh, Superior Studios. Um, you're based in Rotterdam. Um, uh, I want to give you the floor in a minute. First, I want to thank uh, uh, David. Uh, David, I have a question for you later, but um, let's uh, uh, let's first go to the presentation of Jan. Thank you so much again, David. Um, yes, John, please feel free to uh, share your screen and share your stuff with us. Yes, there it is. Yes, perfect. Good. Yeah, sorry, uh, I had some trouble with uh, <laughs> logging in. Um, but um, yeah, my name is Jan Jongert. Um, and uh, partner and founder of Superuse. We're based in Blue City in Rotterdam, uh, the, yeah, uh, Europe's uh, biggest hub for a circular economy, based in a large swimming pool that we are transforming to a um, uh, big hub now already with 60 entrepreneurs all on the forefront of circular economy in very different aspects. Superuse also uh, has its office in Blue City and collab uh, collectively we're working towards a high amount of circularity in the Netherlands. Um, currently we're only at 8% of circular um, material use in the Netherlands for the construction sector, which is a big player, a big part of the CO2 emissions. So we are together striving for a much lower uh, impact. With Superuse, we have uh, four different departments. Um, uh, like I said, one with the headquarters we're based in uh, Blue City, but next to that we have one on site who's floating to different projects. We launched Superuse China in 2016. And uh, in December, we also registered uh, Superuse North America. So currently we're also based in the US. We're uh, known because of the, the blade mate projects we're doing, where we actually take um, the discarded wind turbine blades and use them for various functions. They currently are uh, discarded, uh, incinerated, or buried in landfills, uh, but we turn them into very inspiring playgrounds by uh, readopting them for different functions and saving a lot of CO2 emissions uh, on the go. Uh, there's many different uh, opportunities to use these. So this is uh, turbine blades as urban furniture um, that we have uh, quite close to our office. Um, but as well, it's possible um, to turn it. Well, the, this is a recent example in uh, Shenzhen at the uh, Architecture and Urbanism Biennial. Um, but also they can be turned into um, um, yeah, sound barriers for highways. So this is where we can actually absorb a lot of these uh, materials. And in the 
public realm, we're active uh, on many different levels. Uh, currently, a project that's running is a waste collection center. Uh, it's actually a resource station for the market in the south of Rotterdam, a very tiny project. We're working on it for already six years, um, where we actually uh, collect the waste of the market um, um, and actually the waste that is currently flowing, um, yeah, uh, collected. We collect it in our, our resource station and separate it. So fewer materials are leaving the market and products can be made out of the waste that is uh, uh, collected here. Um, it started uh, with a, as a quite simple project, um, but uh, yeah, of course, built with uh, waste materials, but also with a green roof and water collection. Uh, it had a public function as well. Um, but due to the new knowledge while we were uh, working on the design, we had to expand the project and grow it bigger. It had to move, so it became as well part of a, a running circuit, which now becomes a, a much more exciting running circuit over the building. And um, it has uh, school gardens on top of it that also collect uh, rainwater to make it a more resilient project. So it has many different layers uh, at the same time. And actually, uh, this is a recent image because we're currently harvesting the materials and the construction will actually start uh, next month. So this is very exciting work in progress. The last project I want to show is a housing project, um, which was a, a derelict public uh, building um, that was actually occupied by a group of people that convinced the housing corporation to fund them for their housing. Um, what is special about it is that they have uh, large collective spaces uh, and public spaces, so they have very, they only need very uh, little um, private spaces, so everything that's red here is what is collective. Um, and by uh, adding a couple of housing units in the existing uh, building, we could um, yeah, design 14 uh, dwellings. Uh, over there and this is a very special project because it's social housing uh, with a high standard of circularity and sustainability. All the materials are being harvested from uh, within the Netherlands, a maximum 170 kilometers uh, from the site. Um, and really almost everything has been um, yeah, used from other buildings that have been demolished or from the, the construction site itself. It also, again, collects water, grows plants, it feeds the people uh, with a big part of all the, their required food and uh, realizes houses, uh, housing that really, we think, sets the new standard for social housing in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, contrary to what I showed in the beginning, where uh, the regular projects, uh, regular uh, construction sector has uh, only 8% of um, circular material uh, use, we can uh, realize uh, almost 85% uh, of the materials to be reclaimed um, either from the building itself or from other buildings. So um, also on the circularity, we're able to uh, create um, yeah, ambitious projects uh, with uh, collective projects. And that's important that we think that only the collectivity is able to realize a higher standard in sustainability and circularity. Well, that's the brief overview uh, of what we're currently working on. And I really, uh, yeah, look forward to the discussion as well. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jan, <coughs> for um, uh, very happy that you made it in the end and that you were able to, to share these uh, amazing projects with us. Um, Yes, I, uh, we have about 10 minutes, I think, uh, left in this session uh, before the lunch break is over in, um, uh, with our colleagues on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and I would like to invite all the other um, panelists also uh, to, um, to join us in, in this conversation. Um, because I, have, uh, I was making some notes and I think one thing that, um, I mean, these are four completely different presentations on completely on completely different type of projects uh, related to this simple topic about how do you design 
uh, urban spaces for ecology and social justice. And I think it couldn't be further kind of uh, spanning this this field. But you could also say that there's four perspectives to uh, to approach this uh, this topic. Um, uh, well, the, where the first perspective by by Paul and Kara was from the uh, the institutions and the buildings actually that that form the social infrastructure uh, uh, with their uh, their their super uh, the beautiful museum building, but also um, the the second perspective was really on how to design public space both for people and for uh, other species. Uh, the third perspective, the the one that that David uh, shared with us, was more I think on the um, how do you uh, how do you gather knowledge, but also how do you kind of activate a community uh, to to approach this topic? And the last uh, um, presentation by by Jan uh, really showed how you could also start thinking from a material perspective and the flows within the city. Uh, but I think all of them really also then then uh, uh, connect to this uh, to this topic, and also shows how you can get from like a material to a community. Uh, or how, how these are linked and um, um, uh, that brings me to kind of one question that I think uh, applies to all the so feel free to to answer uh, all of you and that, um, that is about scale um, so a lot of these projects are you could say and it's not to um, uh, uh, disqualify these these projects for sure because I think they're all super inspiring but it's but so these are all prototypes in a way uh, so how could you, so maybe we just one, one round of, of answers, uh, how could you, from that one project, how could you scale up that principle, how could you scale up the effect of, of that intervention? Um, uh, maybe Paul and Kara, would you like to answer first? Well, sure. Um, it's actually an interesting question. So looking at ours from the institutional or the, the building level, um, you can obviously scale it up by connecting those different nodes throughout the, the city and kind of making a network of um, places where you're making an impact and then seeing how the spaces in between those um, kind of kind of become activated through having all of those different nodes. So I think that might be one way to kind of scale it up from from the level that we we kind of presented on. Right, and I think the, uh, the project scale that we were looking at um, is a large museum that's downtown DC can be scaled down to uh, the various types of projects that we work on, which can get to be very tiny projects. So there's um, just a wide variety of scales that, you know, all the same concepts apply to. We're working on another project, so it's a really tiny project that we're starting just now. And you know it's all the same aspects, and we use all the pieces and parts that each of us have talked about when we look at these projects. So it's all interconnected. Yeah. So both from connecting the project the, 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 to like the other nodes in the in, in the city, like you said, uh, camera, but also how do you scale the knowledge within your own practice, basically, to other projects? Uh, I think that's also a beautiful uh, beautiful answer. Um, uh, Jacqueline, um, maybe you can, um, uh, and ML, maybe you could uh, uh, um, tell us something about how how do you think about scaling the, uh, you have some image that you were not supposed to show yet, but maybe you can just tell us something about uh, how do you, how are you thinking about scaling your, uh, your prototype? Yes, um, I mean, the prototype that you saw really is small. 4,000 uh, yeah. feet or so, but the renderings, what we were hiding are the newer renderings. The mm -hmm. renderings that you saw earlier in the presentation are representative of the scale that we will be achieving, you know, by mid, uh, whatever, summer next year. So it's about 10,000 square feet of the wetland with, um, you know, kind of a walking boardwalk so people can go down to the water and really experience it. And honestly, from the inception of this project many, many years ago, um, you know, we certainly have hoped that this will um, expand. Um, and, you know, so we hope our the system that we're developing, which is uh, really unique um, because of the water stream that, that ML showed, but there are, you know, urban wetland projects going on 
across the world. Um, some of the way that we support that is really just through partnerships with other groups. There's a uh, Wild Mile in Chicago, there's a group in um, uh, Boston, um, you know, so uh, we are not a big entity, we are a nonprofit. And so, you know, part of the, the power of the kind of work that we all do in the nonprofit sphere is the ability to partner with other groups who have kind of a similar great idea um, to cre create momentum around it. So I think for us, we hope that there's two paths forward in that. Both scale on, uh, on the site, as well as the um, taking the lessons that we learned to have the longevity of the project and not sink, be um, um, move forward with other uh, partners. Um, Thank you so much. I think uh, David, with with your um, your especially your latest slide with showing all the buildings that are part of your institution and uh, uh, the school I'm representing is also one of those buildings. Um, uh, I think for what you were explaining, what needs to happen there to scale up basically the possible impact of that community is that these buildings uh, also are public buildings. Do you think they are public enough yet? Um, no, no, not yet. I think I'm always telling people that you can walk into any uh, building of, of our university any time of the, during the day and it's always free and it's free entrance for, for everyone. <laughs> it's just another library. Um, but no, it's, I think it's, it's, it's still just like a, a building with, 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 with classrooms and, and teachers and, and, and that's it. Um, but, and I really, uh, well, hope or see the urge of, uh, I believe that we should get our students more uh, out of the classrooms and also like the city and the residents more into our, our, our public, uh, uh, our yeah, public uh, buildings. So I think we have a lot of work to do for that um, and trying to manage it, not that it will be like an, an evasion of students uh, all over the all over the city, but really try to pick some specific points or uh, neighborhoods or uh, spots in the city uh, and on those uh, specific uh, places really work together together with local residents local professionals um to try to to work on 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 those big uh, challenges also like uh, ecology and uh, urbanism and really uh, uh because i think it's 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 something everybody should uh, be working on and experience not just our students but also all residents of Rotterdam yes um uh i would like to maybe we can sit together one sometime soon to really uh, push this agenda forward within uh the the bureaucracy of our organization that's uh, <laughs> yes um thank you so much david um uh, jan um um uh, i think the the well the skill question uh with the projects you were proposing like um uh what do, how how many of these um, projects do we need to have to get from the eight percent of circular material use to maybe like I don't know 80, 80 uh, in twenty fifty I mean in twenty fifty apparently we should be at like hundred percent circular so what what needs to happen it's a big yeah, question yeah. but uh, yeah. <clears throat> so what we see is that there's a lot of these kind of initiatives on with idealistic backgrounds or sometimes funded uh, for a project um uh, yeah to make like these incidents possible um like it's shown in, also in the netherlands it's still incidents happening um what we see is that there's a whole economy actually that is based on um, not sustainable not social uh, drivers um so um, we also when looking at the different flows we also look at the flow of money uh, passing through our society and Actually, we um, more and more uh, understand that um, actually also we need an economical shift that, that's not based on, on continuous uh, growth and that also uh, actually favors labor over the use of resources because uh, what, yeah, like in the West, uh, resources are cheap, um, pollution is cheap, uh, labor is expensive, so everything we do in order to scale uh, this way of working, uh, it's just more costly. And 
in order to change this, um, yeah, some a little bit more radical changes need to happen in the economy to uh, to scale it up according to us. We need to redesign economy. Yeah, and I guess. Uh, we're very happy to to collaborate with uh, Kalen Kingma on uh, on a project uh, really uh, working on this. Uh, it will be shown uh, soon um, on an international platform where we really uh, give different insights in what ways actually our economy could transfer because it's something we we don't understand anymore but uh, it needs uh, the, it needs a change in order to scale up thank you so much so much Jan, for this um it's a it's a it's a big challenge but i think it's also very necessary to uh happy to take that on <laughs> yes um yeah i think that's it we need to uh to wrap up uh thank you all uh thank you paul thank you kara thank you amel jacqueline david and, and jan uh for for sharing your stories with us and your projects um it was super interesting uh it was a bit of a rush but we managed um we have two minutes left originally i think um yeah. christina uh also thank you for um uh starting up this adventure yeah. Um, do, do you want to have any any last yeah. words on this well uh thank you Thais and all these guests I just would like to have them all in one room and start designing something we will start with uh economy we will tackle people we will bring the students outside the classroom we will allow people to get inside the classroom and make them understand that it is an open space where we all can learn we will bring them all to the aquarium and see this beautiful ecosystem that you guys have created which is amazing uh what i liked what i've liked to her here is that designers yeah definitely we design for an economy for people but we cannot um, we cannot forget forget that we are designing for nature as well and all the other species and it is something that also in my studio I forget to inform my students about this and yes we shall design with using what is there already and do this harvest plans that we are going to be learning from you Jan as soon as we get to the Netherlands with all my students because it's, it's something uh, of amazing so I, I would like to um, yeah uh, remind all the um, remind all the, the audience that this is a lecture that gives credits. There are, uh, there's a, a, G, a Google Drive um, forms where you shall uh, fill in your name and your AIA uh, number. I will also like to remind, uh, thank of course the sponsor and the partners for this lecture series, without which we wouldn't have been able to do all this. Um, I would like to remind everybody that we are still sponsoring the students from Oregon to go to the Netherlands and vice versa. And also, I would like to remind you all that this is the first out of four webinars that we're doing. Uh, clearly is within the Morgan uh, lecture series, so there are more in-person as well uh, lectures at the at CBES, at, uh, at the building at the School of Architecture in Baltimore, so please attend. Next week on Tuesday, we're going to have uh, East Wing. And the RDV present company and uh, Dupel and Strikers, uh, and it's going to be uh, moderated by uh, Shinisha Abdrar. So I really hope to see you all. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, guests and lecturers. Thank you for all this information. Have a nice lunch. Thanks, Christina. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.